Kitco News special coverage of Paris Blockchain Week Summit is brought to you by Okra, permissioned DeFi composable index and strategy execution platform. The latest developments in DeFi and crypto are not just changing the way investors invest in cryptos, but also society at large. We're here to discuss this topic with Eowyn Chen. She is the CEO of Trust Wallet. Welcome to the show, Eowyn. Thank you, David. Let's start by talking about your panel that you're doing here at the Paris Blockchain Summit. Can you give us a primer on your topics of discussion? Yeah, so the topic is about talking about DAO and corporate governance. Yeah. Is there anything that traditional uh, organizations could learn from it? So it was very interesting because there are a lot of the governance topics recently come out as the space is uh, very decentralized. So people are also exploring the right social structure uh, to cater to this decentralization model. Okay, uh, let's talk about what a DAO is. Um, not a lot of people, I know th it's been around for a while, but not a lot of people are still aware of what a DAO is. So decentralized autonomous organization, right. yeah. what does it mean? Yes. So that essentially means that there is no traditional legal corporate structure to govern uh, an entire project. So a lot of the decision makings are decentralized. So it's uh, decentralized autonomous in decision making for what a particular project or organization's priority should be. Can you give us a real life example and application of this? Yeah. Um, personally, I think the most successful DAO or the decentralized network is Bitcoin. So Bitcoin came into the effect that there is no real governance structures uh, that tells what the Bitcoin development should be. So it's really decentralized to a lot of the developer communities to determine on where that technology is supposed to go. I think that is the longest running and most successful one. Um, but uh, another also successful one is called MakerDAO. It is one of the algorithm die um, stablecoin organization. So Maker is the governance token that lets the community to decide on how they should um, direct the stablecoin dice. So there's no director or board of directors or a CEO? There was. So that's an interesting thing is that there was a CEO for the project until recently, September last year, that he decides and tell the community that that project uh, core group is no longer existing. So that is after four years, since 2016, 17 afterwards, then they decide on fully decentralization. Okay, so when you say a, an organization is decentralized and is self-governing, what does that mean exactly in practical yeah. uh, governing yeah. term, terms? Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot How of the models, decisions made, for yes, example. Through voting. So usually, for example, Maker, they have a Maker token, that's a governance token. Then people who hold Maker can get a chance to vote on the different proposals. And the majority rules, that's the most common model uh, for decision making. People might say, Ewan, that just sounds like communism. <laughs> or extreme democracy. Extreme democracy, okay. What is a governance token? How does that work? Yeah, governance token is, it can be both non-fungible token, NFT, or fungible token. Um, so that essentially gives people the different rights for voting on the particular projects. Why do you think DAOs are necessary for, let's start with the blockchain space, and then we can talk about outside the blockchain space. Yeah, I think the most interesting thing about crypto or the buzzword of Web3 is fundamentally um, a revolutionary for a social economic structure that the organization can have with its stakeholders. No matter that's users, creators, builders, that is something new orchestrated through tokens. And that is the most interesting part about Web3. So then governance token is one of the orchestration that potentially allow creators, builders, users to become a true stakeholder to determine on the relationship between that organization um, and everyone else in that project. So that's why DAO is very interesting. And governance token is also very interesting in the format that there are a lot of experiments happening in the space to explore what is the best long-term sustainable model that can allow crowd wisdom to survive and also uh, provide the best direction for a project's development. Do you think a DAO structure can be applied to uh, corporate governance outside of the crypto space? Why can't a large tech company, Facebook, Amazon, be governed by a DAO? I think that's more of a cultural issue than a fundamental, uh, and also legal structure issue than, um, than anything else. The challenges with DAO is that it's very hard to regulate to determine on what is the right legal right. status a DAO can be. But for a traditional organization, like no matter Facebook or someone else, who are you going to sign the contract with when you're having a business relationship? So far, I think there's still a lot more exploration happening in this space. Are you saying that if, let's say, a project, which is essentially a startup, 
becomes large enough that it needs to change its corporate governance structure from a DAO to something, I guess, more traditional, easier to regulate? I think different people have different ideas. Okay. I only have still a working thesis. My idea was actually that for the development of an organization, it's easier to bootstrap as a centralized traditional model because you need that strong leadership, strong vision to unite everyone and then just focus on execution. Yeah. But then, as the organization grow, it's no longer people rule. It should be system rule. I actually think that as the organization gets bigger, there is better opportunity for DAO to potentially be a long-term sustainable model for the project to thrive. Interesting. Now, let's go back to Bitcoin. So earlier you said that Bitcoin is decentralized. There's no one governing entity or body dictating how developers should uh, you know, build on Bitcoin. Let's take the latest upgrade, Taproot, a few months ago. What was the decision-making process behind that? Who, who came together and said, you know what, we need to upgrade Bitcoin? Yeah, honestly, I'm not the most knowledgeable in terms of the Bitcoin community. Uh, my understanding is that even though it's decentralized decision-making, but there are still very passionate developers and communities and projects, they are making directional leadership. But what if, what if two developers argue and you know, yeah. they have a, a disagreement over how to proceed? Yeah. What, what happens then? There's no CEO or... Uh, manager, you know, making the decision ultimately, right? Yeah, that's where the governance tokens voting rights okay. come into play, I right? See. Whoever that has the most token, yeah. they hold it, people voted it, the majority rules. Actually, I take that back. That's not communism, that's just capitalism. Whoever has more money gets more votes. <laughs> I actually think that could be a challenge for the space to think about because um, if it's proof of stake, solely based on how much money that yeah. um, people have with the token gets to rule, then it's going to be very much like an oligarchy. Capitalism. Um, so then, here comes down to the security side. Is that's why I think someone else, someone has a very interesting point about you do good by doing uh, you do well by doing good. Earlier Bitcoiners, they instead of amass a Bitcoin, they actually distribute Bitcoin out. Uh, Alex, someone was distributing Bitcoin to every MIT students back right. in the earlier days. Right. And the whole point is about distributing out Bitcoin can make the whole network more secure, yes. you can increase more stakeholders yes. uh, that ultimately can stabilize the system way better. Okay, let's move on to Web3. Yeah. And earlier offline, you told me that Web3s are changing society. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but that's yeah. basically what you told me. That's a very deep thought. Can you expand on that? Yeah, again, this is a working thesis. Uh, yeah. I think the Web2 world, which is where... So you're saying it's changing and now where we'll change it because I think we're not fully migrated to Web3. Yes, yet, right? yes. I think it's a, it's a work in progress. Right. And, uh, um, the traditional world that we're in right now is Web2. What does that mean? It means that a lot of the big corporations essentially build a closed ecosystems and then gets to decide what is the relationship and profit model of sharing between creator and the organization. So simple ones will be TikTok, Facebook, Google, they all can decide on how much do I give back to creators who are contributing to the knowledge building of that particular platform. Um, but at some point, you find that earlier on, they give out information and values for free so that you get the hockey stick growth. But at a certain point that they are gonna plateau, then the organization and the creators and the users, they are becoming competitors yeah. within that network for stakes. Um, so what Web3 are potentially doing differently is to reshape that stakeholder relationship to put to give people tokens when they're participating in the right activities that creates value in that ecosystem and network so that um, everyone becomes more of a stakeholder rather than just a user or just a creator receiving mercy from the big corporation. Okay, so I'm, I'm somebody who just wants to go on my internet, browse, yeah. check my emails, watch YouTube, whatever. Yeah. How does Web3 affect me? Yeah, so it probably won't affect day-to-day -day users as much compared to creators. Yes. So you're contributing a lot of your time and your knowledge or information to Twitter to get it for free. And we see some interesting social Web3 projects that are essentially allow every action, like when you post, when you like something, you get a certain token reward. And that allows people to be aligned with uh, having the economic sharing when they are contributing to that network. Um, so you could probably take off, but I think there needs to be a balance between how about people just expect information to be free versus people expect that every contribution action are going to have a return. I feel that this is the potential experimental field that we can see more as the space rolled out in the longer term. Okay, we're gonna end with trust follow. But before that, I wanna talk about what you think is probably some of the most important developments in the crypto space right now besides, besides Web3 yeah. and DAOs. 
I think at, at least in Trust Wallet, we care about enabling mass people, general people. So what we focus on is ease of use of the product so that we can give people around the world a chance to experience crypto and own a crypto. And something I think are very important at least from this mission or this angle is how do we open up the doorway so that we can get more people to, ex to experience crypto for the first time. Yeah. And then it is about how do we enable people to be responsible uh, in yeah. the crypto space. So some important initiatives I feel is that centralized organizations are still going to be important, especially in the KYC, know your customer space, because that's going to be the bridge and the gateway between how fiat gets into crypto. Yes. Right now, the percentage of the crypto in the entire world's assets are still just single digit percentages. So there's still a lot more room to go. How can we open up that onboarding process easier yeah. for people? Then on the other side, we see so many ecosystems within the space are hanging out and playing with each other. We get different public chains, but they're often kind of siloed ecosystem. So there are a lot of development recently on how do we break that silos and the boundaries to enable cross-chain um, interactions so that no matter ultimately it's just going to be a few chains survive or it's going to be every chain has a step specialized purposes. I feel that multi-chain interoperability is going to be one of the key to determine on are we going to survive with a few ecosystem or uh, multiple ones. Well, one last question, I'll let you go. Now, actually your name comes from a Lord of the Rings character. You were telling me Lord of the Rings, the theme is, you know, freedom from oppression, which is something that you think relates to the blockchain space. Um, I want to talk about how you think people can achieve financial freedom through cryptocurrencies yeah. and what Trust Wallet is doing to achieve that mission. Yeah. Um, I think I chose Lord of the Ring is because power corrupts. And that is one of the challenges when you are or organizing, running a centralized organization, is how do you resist that fundamental temptation about amassing power, amassing data, amassing uh, or closed door access so that you keep everything in control of yourself. This is a reminder that I wanted to share with myself is that wallet being a very important infrastructure to help users to browse and connect to Web3, we need to continue to remind ourselves to be open. Otherwise, we just could very much become another Web2 closed door ecosystem. And that will not be beneficial to what Web3's uh, mission to kind of change that social economic structure in the long term yes. between organization and the users. So, and what I have been focusing on, again, is how as a wallet, we can provide the best ease of the use for people to access it and without and still open source as much building blocks as possible so that the space is still very early, we can continue to grow together. Right. Um, and that contributes to the fundamental thesis about Web3 is about openness and decentralization. Hey, well, I want to thank you so much for your thoughts. Thank you. Excellent thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Kitco News special coverage of Paris Blockchain Week Summit is brought to you by Okra, permissioned DeFi composable index and strategy execution platform.